my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others. Punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord help save comfort and defend us gracious Lord Be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, the martyred innocents of Bethlehem showed forth your praise not by speaking but by dying. Put to death in us all that is in conflict with your will that our lives may bear witness to the faith we profess with our lips. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. For our first reading, we go to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 63, beginning with verse 7. You see how it speaks about how the Lord was so good and kind to his people. 
You know how good and kind He is to us through the true Son, even though we don't deserve it. I will tell about the Lord's mercies, about the praises of the Lord, about all that the Lord has done for us, about His great goodness to the house of Israel which he performed for them according to his abundant compassion and according to his great mercy. He said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. So he became their Savior. In all their anguish he felt anguish, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he himself redeemed them, and he took them up and carried them all the days of old. The word of the Lord. We sing the psalm of the day, Psalm 2, Great are the works of the Lord. Notice that the words and the music for this psalm are on the big screen. Great are the works of the Lord. second reading is taken from Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Because we are redeemed by God's true Son, we are now able to call Him Father. But when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son to be born of a woman, so that He would be born under the law, in order to redeem those under the law, so that we would be adopted as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts to shout, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir of God through Christ. The Word of the Lord. 
please stand for the gospel acclamation and the holy gospel. song. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with verse 13. This is also the sermon text. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream. He said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod will search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, he was furious. He issued orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding countryside from two years old and under. This was in keeping with the exact time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet, was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. The angel said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to kill the child are dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. When he heard that Archelaus, Herod's son, had succeeded his father as ruler in Judea, he was afraid to go there. Since he had been warned in a dream, he went to the region of Galilee. When he arrived there, he settled in a city called Nazareth. So what was spoken through the prophets was fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We invite you to fill out the white attendance guest cards in front of you, and after the sermon you can place the filled out form into one of the baskets. Those online who are watching, we welcome, and you can use the QR code there or the link that is provided. We use these in order to encourage all of us in our worship and then also to get to know everybody better. Let's sing together hymn number 355, Let All Together Praise Our Lord.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The Christmas season isn't exempt from its shares of troubles and tragedies. What I mean is families gather together and what is meant to be a joyful time of gathering and sharing gifts and sharing a meal might turn sour as old feuds and disagreements begin to rear their ugly heads. If you watch the daily news, you realize that that daily stream of trouble and tragedies that you hear doesn't take time off for Christmas. In fact, there's been some terrible tragedies over the years over Christmas. And even this last year, I can remember the day after Christmas, turning on the news, and what do I see as special as they're going more in-depth reporting, talking about the mass amount of murders that happened on Christmas Day this year across the entire country. We see that even on Christmas, those troubles, those hardships, those tragedies continue to go on. And even if this past year you haven't had a hard Christmas or troubles or tragedies take pay, place, you're left with the rea reality that as you go on from this Christmas season, you have to go on with your regular life of maybe going to a job or going to school and that grind that comes along with it. Except now you don't have that anticipation we had for roughly the last month that Christmas is coming and it's an exciting time to come. At least there's New Year's, right? Today we're gathered tonight on New Year's Eve and we're looking forward to the year to come as many people do. Many people are hoping for this year to be better than the last. As many want to leave this last year behind them. What's ironic is last year at this time they're feeling the same way as the year before and we're looking forward for this year to come and be so great and wonderful only to be, well, let down again and we can't wait for it to be over. What we have to realize is that this world is full of trials, this world is full of troubles, it's full of problems, difficulties, and tragedies. That in this world, you can say that there's really no lasting hope, at least worldly speaking. And we know that tomorrow will bring, might, might be some good times, that even though this year coming there might be good, that it'll have its share of trials and tragedies and heartache as well. It's because of the status of this world that, well, Christmas, the Christmas season, and our Christian faith is so important for us to have. It's so important for us to have to get through this coming year. Because as we look at Christmases and the Christmas seasons of the past and years of the past, we realize they're full of trial and trouble and sorrow, but we have to realize also this is nothing, not anything new. That even that first Christmas was full of its tragedies, it came soon after Jesus was born. We have that recorded in our gospel lesson for today. Now Christmas there, that first Christmas, it started out great and wonderful and full of joy. Those angels came and, and announced the coming of the Savior to those shepherds. And those shepherds went, and went to the, the stable there and saw Jesus. It was a joyful time. And even the days following it were great. Mary and Joseph did what they were supposed to do. They took Jesus on the eighth day to go get circumcised as, the, as was commanded, as they were fulfilling what was, was proclaimed would happen. And then weeks and maybe months later came, and then the wise men came. The wise men came, which would be, would be celebrating later on this week when Epiphany starts, but now we're going to fast forward a little bit past that. Wise men came, and now they are leaving, and what do we see happening? We're seeing this Christmas season, this wonderful, joyful time, start to be filled with tragedy. You see, right, after, or right before they left, God came to them. An angel appeared to those wise men and told them not to go back to Herod, because Herod had some evil intentions in mind. Really, you could say the devil was behind it. The devil was planning on destroying God's plan of salvation for you and me when it was quite literally still in its infancy, when Jesus was still just a baby there at that time. He just sought to bring trouble and hardship to steal that joy of Christmas once and for all. We see this happening throughout all of history in the Old Testament where the devil continually tried to God, make God's people, the Israelites, go away from the promise of the Savior, kept trying to destroy it. We see that happening so far as when God had to send the flood to protect it. Now when this baby was here, he was trying, to, the devil was trying to kill that promise of a Savior, that salvation, right in the cradle. 
as he would work through Herod. In the section before the, our gospel lesson for today, we see that when the wise men came to Herod, Herod acted like he was excited and wanted to go and worship Jesus as well. He told the, the wise men, when you go and find this child, come back to me. I want to go worship him. I want to go praise him. That was not Herod's intention at all. He wanted to kill Jesus because Herod was afraid of losing his crown. He was afraid that he could no longer be in control and rule. And you might ask yourself, why would Herod be afraid of this little infant child? Well, the reality is, is that Herod, he may have that title of king of the Jews, but he himself wasn't a Jew. He was put there and in pla put in place there by the Romans. And when he heard this promised Messiah had come, I'm sure he began to become afraid. Afraid that this Messiah, this Savior that all the Jews were waiting for would rally behind him. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future. Or maybe if at this point, rebel against him, saying, we have our true king, our Messiah here. And Herod would be left without any power. See, Herod was a ruthless man. He was one that fought hard for the power he had and killed many people to get it. And he wanted to retain his power so badly, he was willing to kill all the babies in Bethlehem up to two years old and the surrounding area to keep it. But he didn't realize that he was doing, and I'm sure Satan, as he was behind us, didn't realize doing, that he was fulfilling prophecies that Jeremiah had made hundreds of years before. When he said, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted, because they are no more. In the section before our gospel lesson today, we see that when the wise men came to Herod, he went so as far as to get the people who knew about God's word to look in God's word, look for the proof that of where Jesus would be born. And they found it, they said, here in Bethlehem. You see that Herod had the proof right in front of his very eyes. He had God's word and these prophecies that had written, were written hundreds of years before, and he saw them being fulfilled right before him, but what did he do? He rejected them. Rejected God's word when the proof was right in front of him, went after what his sinful nature wanted him to do, and sought to destroy this promised Messiah, this promised Savior would come. Yet God knew all this would happen, and God would see his plan through. He would see his plan through that Jesus would survive to be our substitutes, that we would have our inheritance in heaven. Yet we look at what Herod did and we realize how terrible it was. It's hard for us to imagine. All the babies, all the males there, two years old and younger, not just Bethlehem, the surrounding area, were all killed. It brings to mind some of the terrible atrocities that we hear about in the news all the time. It may be even some that we might have heard over this last Christmas season. It makes us realize that, yes, this world that we live in is full of sin, and this year to come, it's a year that won't be any different. There'll still be trials. There'll still be troubles. There'll still be terrible things that have happened as the devil still continues to do his work. We see those effects of the sin in the world around us. We see the lengths that Herod went to keep his control and power, and we see people today doing the same. We see how the devil continues to drag, try to drag people away from God's word so that they can be brought down to hell with him. And we can look at these things that Herod have done and say, well, this is so terrible. I don't do anything like that. We have to be honest with ourselves and realize that, well, when you get down to it, what was Herod doing? He was rejecting God's word and going after what his sinful desires wanted. And it's something that we do the same each day. Where we push God's word out and we just go after our sinful nature, the desires of our sinful nature, and chase after them. And what we have before us today is an example of what happens when that sinful nature remains unchecked. That the terrible things that is capable of doing that we, as we possess that same sinful nature, are capable of doing the exact same. We have a sinful nature that continues to try to rebel against God. We see it coming out in maybe some smaller ways, if you want to call it that. 
that maybe we might look at past Christmases that haven't been that good or maybe past family gatherings that haven't been that great and we have to realize that maybe some of those arguments and those disagreements that came up had to do with our own grudges, had to do with our own, excuse me, our own anger towards someone else that we couldn't let go of. We have to admit that some of the hard times that we've had in our lives and Christmases and years past can come down to being our own fault because our own selfish pride, just as Herod had that selfish pride. And we see if we leave that sinful nature go unchecked, what can be the result? For Herod, well, it's not just the physical death, the physical death that all of us will feel because of our sinful nature and the sins that we commit. But for Herod, though, it was destruction of faith, so he had no faith at all, which means eternal suffering in hell. You see, Herod stands as a warning for us today. And in this year to come, it leads us to ask the question, who is ruling our hearts? Is it our sinful nature that's ruling it, or our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? What are we focusing on? What are we letting, us, what are we letting guide us in this year to come? It was this unchecked sinful nature that hated God that led Herod to try to destroy and kill Jesus, the Savior in the world, and Satan was using that to try to destroy God's plan of salvation. But this is where we see the comfort in this lesson before us today. That God destroyed Satan's plan. Knowing our psalm there, we read there, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, God scoffs at them as they're making these plans, and you can almost see that happening in our lesson for today. How does it start? It starts by saying, when they had gone, when the wise men had left, what, did, what came next? What, next? what did God do? An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. God knew what Herod was planning on doing. God knew what Satan was on planning on doing and trying to end his plan of salvation. And God wasn't going to let it happen. He didn't wait for Herod to finally figure out, okay, they're not coming back. Now I need to go send the soldiers and let them on their way. No, Bethlehem was only about a two-hour walk away from Jerusalem. Immediately, God told Mary and Joseph to pick everything up and leave. God's plan of salvation, his true son there, was never under any threat of being killed or destroyed because God knew the plans of everyone else, and he saw fit to bring his plan through. So he told Mary and Joseph to flee. Flee all the way to Egypt for safety. Now you see, Egypt was a place that oftentimes was used through safety, for safety or for food when times of drought and famine. We see that all through the Old Testament. A Abraham went there multiple times when there wasn't food. And of course, we can remember then with Jacob and his son Joseph, where he, Jacob sent his sons to Egypt, not knowing that Joseph was there in second in command, was able to provide them food. And eventually then bring J Jacob and his entire family to go and live in Egypt. We see how God used that. As God used that to answer the promise and come through with the promises he made to make them into a great nation. Of course, then in Egypt they were brought into slavery. And eventually God had Moses come and with the Exodus brought them out. We see the, the prophet Hosea making reference to that when he says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But Hosea's words were not just meant for the Exodus. He was looking forward. Looking forward to this event that would happen as he would eventually, God would call Mary and Joseph and Jesus out of, out of Egypt to come back to the land there and eventually settle in Nazareth. We see once again where the people of this world are making their plans and the Satan's making his plans and you can see how God is really laughing. Laughing as he uses those to fulfill the prophecies that were made so long ago. And God continued to see his plan through. Satan continued to try to derail this, continued to ha try to have Jesus killed, continued to try to get him off course, but that never happened. Jesus stayed true to all the way to the end. He was born under the law like you and me, kept all of it perfectly, never falling short once. And what happens? He goes to the cross and 
And even there, what happens? After he suffered hell in our place, Jesus gave up his spirit. It wasn't taken from him. We see that God was in control all the time, that God saw his plan through so that Jesus would die in our place and be our perfect substitute. So what? So you and I can become true sons and daughters of God, which means our inheritance is heaven. We see that coming through in our epistle lesson. This brings us comfort as we come to the year ahead. As we realize that God is ultimately the one in control. That no matter this year is a better year than the past one, or if it's worse, or no matter what happens, there's going to be good, but there's going to be those hard times that come. We know that God is in control of all things. And look, Satan tried and tried and couldn't defeat God and his plan. And Satan is still trying today to drag people away. We see those sin in the world around us, but we know one thing, that God is still in control. And since God saw his plan through, through his true son, and made us his true sons and daughters, we know that no matter what happens this coming year, that our salvation is certain, that our inheritance of heaven is certain, so we can approach this coming year with joy. We can approach this coming year with hope because God's plan of salvation was completed and is still completed to this day. God's Son dwells in each and every one of your hearts through faith. So we know with confidence that we are God's true sons and daughters. You can live in that confidence for the year to come. Live in that confidence every day knowing that God saw his plan through, through his true son. You are God's true sons and daughters. Amen. Please rise. We continue with confessing our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from the true God, begotten not in me, one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also place those attendance cards in the offering baskets that are passed. We love because Christ first loved us. We continue with the offering hymn, hymn number 334, I Stand Beside Your Manger Here.
before the prayer of the church for New Year's, we'll have our intercessory prayers. We pray for the families of Val Wagner, Cindy Sneeder, and Velva Fisher, who is the mother of Doran Fisher, as all three were taken home to heaven by our Lord. We pray. Dear God of all comfort, we thank you that in your fatherly love, you gave your merciful guidance and constant blessing in body and soul throughout the lives of Val Wagner, Cindy Sneeder, and Velva Fisher. Let your holy word comfort those who are grieving. Strengthen them with the assurance that in all things you are at work in truth and love. Teach us all, Lord, to number our days. Help us seek the things that are above, that we may at last appear before your presence in peace and joy. Eternal Father, before whom all generations rise and fall, teach us to think earnestly on the brevity of our lives and the immensity of your goodness. Help us to enter the new year trusting in the name of your Son and walking in the way of his peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. We continue with the communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whose wonderful and mysterious birth you have opened our eyes to the glory of your grace and renewed in our hearts the fervor of your love. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. be seated for a short announcement. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members of our church and church body come to Holy Communion, approach up the middle aisle and return down a side aisle. When indicated, kneel or remain standing at the rail. Receive the wafer with an open hand and take the wine cup yourself from the tray. And if you prefer to be handed the wine cup, simply hold out your hand. And hold your wafer hand up like stop if you want a gluten-free wafer available in a sleeve on the tray. And non-alcoholic white wine is also available in the middle of the cup tray. And cup receptacles are along the walls. And the common wine cup or chalice is provided as a choice. And the general blessing will be given at the end. Come, all things are now ready.
the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We close our worship, our New Year's Eve worship, as we sing hymn number 367, Across the Sky, the Shades of Night.
Once again, Happy New Year. Thank you. And also, it's so good to see all of you and uh, God's blessings on your way home. Just take it easy. Just a reminder that everything goes back to our regular schedule next weekend with Bible classes and also Sunday school. Ladies Aid will meet also this week at the usual time. On Thursday, however, we want to remember that that's the postponed date for our children's services, the ones for grades 1 through 8. And again, that's Thursday, January 5th, grades 1 through 8, Christmas services, 9 and 6 o'clock. So 9 in the morning and 6 p.m. We hope you can make one of those. Very important. Cindy's Sneeder, Cindy's funeral will be on Friday at 2 o'clock at Uffermeister's Funeral Home. You can already go there at noon as visitation will start before the funeral at noon. If you haven't picked up your envelopes, be sure to do that. Live streamers are needed. Those that make sure we get this service out, especially on TV and uh, on the internet. So if you can help in any way, be sure to let us know. And also January 14th is a tubing ski trip. And you're looking for them to sign up yet, or? Okay, he's going to get the sign-up sheet, so look for that. Look for that. Once again, Happy New Year to all of you, and uh, God's blessings to you. Good, good to see you tonight. Thank you.